We're going to read in uh, Luke chapter 13 verses. Uh, we're going to read all the way through um, verse 8, verse 9. Okay. There were some present at that very time who told him, talking about Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none. Cut it down. Why should it use up the ground? And he answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure. Then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for this word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you uh, will speak forth your truth. Oh, Lord, I pray for every heart that's here, that you would minister to our hearts, Lord God, and that you'd bring revelation. Holy Spirit, we need your revelation, Lord, regarding this truth about repentance. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You know, the goodness and mercy of God, it, it waits for people to repent. And I want you to know that true repentance will produce God's peaceable fruit of righteousness. In Matthew chapter 3, you know, there's a lot of reading tonight maybe, but, but, the, but the word of God says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and he said, Repent for the kingdom of heaven as at hand and this he had spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight in verse 7 he says but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them O generation of vipers who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance and think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham and now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees therefore every tree which brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And, and I, the reason that I read that is because in both of those passages of scripture, it talked about at the end that, that, that it wasn't bearing fruit and that it was time for it to be cast down and for it to be thrown in, into the fire. And, and that in both of these passages of scripture, it talked about the, the word repentance. I want you to know that the word repentance is used in the New Testament and it's also translated in the Old Testament. Um, but one, one of the ways that it's worded in the Old Testament doesn't even use the word repent. Well, let, me give you, let me give you the definition of the word repent out of the New Testament. It means to change one's mind. It means to reconsider. To reconsider the fact that the way you used to think isn't really lining up with the ways of God. All right. Uh, and, and but in the Old Testament, let me read you this passage of scripture out of Jeremiah. It says this. A voice was heard on the high places, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord, their God. And it says in verse 22, return you backsliding children and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto you, for you are the Lord our God. The word return there is, is one of the words that means repent. It means to return or to turn back to God. To, to, sometimes it's translated as restore, to recover. It, it, sometimes it's used to describe the word converts. 
So the New Testament word describes a change of the mind, but the Old Testament word describes a change of direction. And so not only is it a change of the mind to repent before God, but it's also a change of direction. Amen. And, and, and so we, we go from moving away from God to moving towards God whenever a true repentance uh, takes place. I want you to know that without the ministry of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for true repentance to take place. The scripture says uh, that, that when he comes talking about the Holy Spirit, that he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me. And we know that. We see it in the world. I, listen, thank you guys, the people that came out and helped us pass out the tracks uh, you know, for Labor Day. I ran into one guy, and this was an interesting thing because the next day I got a text from Miss Cheryl, and she said, have you ever heard people talking about that they say that they believe in the Old Testament, that they don't believe that Jesus is God because they don't believe the New Testament? And that's the same exact thing that I ran into you know, at the festival. I believe in the Old Testament. That's one of the reasons I really like to go out on the street. I don't want to take too much time with this. But it also helps me stay aware of what's going on out there in the world. Next time I'll be ready. I'm like, well, where's your goat, bud? <laughs> you, got your, you got your goat or you got your sheep with you? Because you say you believe in the Old Testament, so you must believe in the wrath of God. Where's your sacrifice, right? Uh, but, but nevertheless, I just want you to know that that's what the ministry, one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction upon the hearts of the world because they're not believing in Jesus. But I got to tell you that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is for the church also. Amen. The ministry of the Holy Spirit is to bring conviction to the people people yes. of God. Yes. And conviction is a good thing. I know I've been talking about this uh, quite a bit lately, but I want you to know don't feel bad when you feel conviction. Feel good. Rejoice. Yeah. Because hallelujah. You the enemy would want you to get up and run. That's right. The enemy would want you to flee a place where you feel uncomfortable, but I'm here to tell you it's a good thing to be able to feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Mm. That word means the convict means to convince or to tell a fault, to bring a rebuke. It has a suggestion of shame of the person that's convicted to call to account and to show one his fault and to demand an explanation. Those that belong to the Lord, listen, the Holy Spirit, if we are sensitive enough to hear and to feel his presence, he's wanting us to give an account. He's wanting us to give an explanation. I need an explanation from you, Matt. Why is it that you that you venture away from me? Why is it that you would turn and go in an opposite direction of my word that you know that I have already spoken to you? I need an explanation, son. Conviction and repentance are intricately woven together. And again, true repentance requires a moving of the Holy Spirit on the heart of the individual for them to feel like compunction. That's a word that was under the word repent, compunction. It's, it describes a feeling of guilt in order to really come to the place where you even have a desire to repent. Listen, I'm not trying to beat nobody down. I'm not trying to put heavy burdens and weights on you. I'm trying to make a point that... That you, unless the Holy Spirit lets you feel the need to repent, you may think that you're okay. Yes. Listen, the Word of God says this. Jesus said it. And he said this. He said, rightly the, the prophet Isaiah spoke about you, you hypocrites. He was talking to the Pharisees, which are religious people. Come on. You understand that? That religious people are still in churches today. Just because it was in just because it was in the time frame of Jesus doesn't mean that the spirit of the Pharisee doesn't live on today in the house of God or in people that call themselves the people of God. Y'all understand that? Amen. And he said, well, did the prophet Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites? And he, he said, he said that you would draw near me with your mouth, but that your hearts would be far from me. And, 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 and I fear that so oftentimes people that, are, that grow up in church or people that sit in church repeatedly, day, you know what I'm saying, week after week, service after service. And, and if we're really hearing the word of God or we're hearing some type of a mixture that sounds kind of like the word of God without us realizing it is that our hearts can become callous to the truth. 
Yeah. And, and when our hearts become callous, we don't feel the compunction or the conviction of the Holy Spirit anymore right. on our hearts. Right. You know, there are actions of wrong and we've all felt those moments. You know what I'm talking about? Like whenever we've done something, y'all know what I'm talking about. We've all felt the moments when we made an action that was wrong, yeah. right? And, and, but yet at the same time, what about a life of wrong? You know, because I'm talking to the sinner right now. I know that none of y'all are, the, y'all are the saints of God, amen? Praise God. But, but, but hold on a sec, see, because one of the things that I want to get into tonight is, is my concern of the shift that has taken place since the years that I first heard the God, well, not first heard it, but at 19 years old when I heard the gospel go forth in that little church in Berwick. Mm. Some major shifting has taken place in the church world. Some of you, you might have been in diapers back when I got saved. I don't know. Probably. Some of you might not have even been born yet. What about a lifetime of wrong? I'm talking about all of us when we came finally to the realization that we needed Jesus. Amen. See, the, the word of God says in the Corinthian letter that godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, yeah. not to be repented of. In other words, you're not supposed to change your mind of this. When you come to the place where the Holy Spirit deals with you yeah. and you repent and it brings you into a place of salvation, you should never be sorry that you repented. Yeah. Nobody should ever have to say that they were sorry because they preached on repentance. Yeah. Nobody should ever have to say that they're sorry because they preached on the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But the sorrow of the world works death. Yes. 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 Does a human have to realize the error of their ways in order to gain new life? Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah. Now listen, I didn't even think about parts of your message whenever I wrote this, and then I thought about it later when I was reading it in there. So, but listen, I want to say this because and this has to do with my life, my past life. It's not just about the drugs and alcohol that resulted in loss of time, loss of time, loss of jobs, money and relationships, or the sorrow that the mistakes made in a marriage that resulted in the loss of family. But what about sorrow over realizing that one had lived their lives in opposition against God? And the reason that I think that this is important is, again, we're living in the midst of a church world where these kinds of things are not really spoken of. And, and many times people that believe that they're serving God, but have still continued to live their lives in opposition to God. Right, right. Do, do people need to know that? That that's a possibility that, that people would live their lives in opposition to God? Or, or does a person just need to ask Jesus into their heart? Come on. Come on, I'm going somewhere with this. This is important. Does a person just need to just to be told all you got to do is just ask Jesus into their heart? No need to focus on remorse over breaking God's commandments or his heart over sinning against his holiness or his word. Just say a prayer that asks Jesus into your heart and everything is good. No. Another Jesus. No. Through the years, again, I've noticed that there's been a great effort that's placed on making it easy for people to get saved. Yes, right. yes. Right? right? Turn that what I, I, I dimmed the lights a little bit. <laughs> Let's turn out the lights and look. Close your eyes and raise your hand. Come on. Okay. And now I'm just going to ask you to take one more step. Come on. <laughs> Praise God, Trey. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord's been working in me. Amen, brother. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm kind of talking right now. I'm just kind of making this up. But praise God. Close your eyes and raise your hand. Hallelujah. I'm not trying to embarrass you. But I'm going to ask you to come forward and pray a prayer. And then we get excited. Praise God. 20 people made a decision for the Lord today. But there wasn't one word of remorse uttered to God. Maybe they repeated the word repent. But they didn't even really know what it meant. And you can't truly believe in your heart if you haven't repented of your sin. We have to change both our mind and our direction. Yes, yes. 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 In order for a person to truly repent, the Holy Spirit has to move on the heart to convict them of sin. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to go ahead and read this long passage of Scripture. We can go to Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 16. I'm in the King James Version on this one here. 
It says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. Can you imagine that? That there would, that there would be a people that the word of the Lord was a reproach to them. And, and look, this is the people of God. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of, of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. For the, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. Now look at this is what I want you to see. Because I do believe that this is still happening in the world that we live in today. It says, from the prophet even unto the priest, everyone deals falsely. I'm not trying to say that every preacher is dealing falsely. It's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to say that false, false doctrines are rampant and we were warned that they would come. And look what it says. They healed the hurt of my daughter of my people slightly, yes, saying, yes. peace, peace, when there is no peace. When we offer for someone to raise their hand, to close their eyes and to say, now you're at peace with God. But there's never been any true repentance of the heart that has come to the realization that I've gone against you, Lord, that I've done wrong. Would you please? For, and I'm not saying that you have to do it at this altar. As a matter of fact, I'm not even so certain that it should always happen that way. Don't get me wrong. I've seen times when the conviction of the Holy Spirit will come over the hearts of people and they'll come to the altars and they'll weep and they'll sob and they'll cry out to God and that's a beautiful thing to see but at least if it would happen in our homes at least when it, if it would happen in our prayer life when we get along with the Lord and we say Lord have your way have your way in my heart and he goes on to say in verse 15 were they ashamed when they committed abomination nay they were not at all ashamed neither could they blush they couldn't even blush with the things that they had done against the Lord. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall at the time I, that I visit them. They shall be cast down, said the Lord. And this is one of my favorite Old Testament passages. You ready? Here we go. Verse 16. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways. What does that mean? Stand at the crossroads where everybody's traveling and see and ask for the old path. See, everybody's looking for something new. They're looking for, they're looking for young preachers. Come on, looking for young preachers, looking for new music, looking for like a new, clean, like fresh atmosphere, clean. You see what I'm trying to get at? We want everything new. We want it to smell new. We want it to look new. And, and but what he says is this, stand in the ways, see and ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And walk therein and you shall find rest for your soul. But look what they said. They said, we will not walk therein. And there's people, and listen to me, there's things that are happening in the church world that we live in that nobody wants to walk the old path. Nobody wants to receive the wisdom of the elders. Nobody wants to understand the way that things used to be done, the way that the gospel used to be preached, and things have changed before our very eyes. Yes, yes. There's a scripture in Romans chapter 2, and he says, that the, are you presuming or did you not know that it was the kindness of God that leads a man to repentance? Amen. I love that scripture. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And look, we don't have time to break it down right now. But listen, maybe it's, it, and you, you can put it up there if you want, but we don't need to. Romans chapter two, verses four and five. Why don't you go home and try to ponder on that when you go to, before you go to bed tonight? I want you to know this. I want you to know that. He suffers long with us. I want you to know that God is patient. He's kind and he yes. endures with us. The goodness of God spoken of here is directly related to his patience in waiting for us to repent. It's saying that he is being merciful and giving us time. It's not saying that he is being so sweet and soft spoken to us that we finally melt in his goodness and wake up one day deciding to love him. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that his goodness 
is, is shown in his patience and his kindness and his willingness to long suffer, to wait one more day, to wait another moment for the, for the presence of the Lord to grab a hold of someone and grab a hold of them and bring them to a place of repentance. You know, I was, I was thinking, too, about when I was talking about that story, you know, about I don't want to embarrass you, you know, whenever I was trying to tell that little story right there, you know, raise your hand and close your eyes. I don't want to embarrass you. <clears throat> but I was thinking about the woman with the alabaster box. You know, I was thinking about um, the fact that it might have been embarrassing for her. I mean, the, the text doesn't talk about embarrassment. As a matter of fact, I don't see any embarrassment there. So if there was embarrassment, maybe it was when she was trying to press through the crowd to get there. Because we pretty much understand that there would have been a crowd there. Jesus' disciples would have been there. There would have been other people there because they would have heard that the teacher was there, that the Pharisee had invited. Right. And, and, I, and I imagine that if there was embarrassment, it was the moment when she had determined in her heart, you see, you can't convince me the, re the reason that she's there. Either she was listening outside to something that he was teaching and the Lord struck her heart right then and there. Or she had already had an encounter with him somewhere and she heard that he was there and she had to get to him. But something had already happened for her to display the, 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 the emotions that she displayed at the feet of Jesus. Something had already happened. It was, she displayed nothing but pure love and repentance for the master. And if any embarrassment took place, it had to have been when she was trying to press through the crowd to get to him. And, and the whispers of the people that would have been in the crowd. There's that sinful woman. Because that's what the text says, that she was a sinful woman. She was one of those kinds of women that everybody in the neighborhood knew about. She had a reputation. That's what the text says. And she, but she pushes through the crowd and she begins to... Pour her love out on the Lord. You know, and, and I just think about the fact that so many times that we don't want to be embarrassed, right, about the things of God. Somebody help us here. We've all been through it. We've all been in places where we didn't want to be embarrassed to be associated with Jesus. Peter didn't want to. Peter was embarrassed the night that he denied the Lord. I don't know him. And then he started cursing. Come on. Sometimes I wonder about the way we respond to people when we see the Lord touching them. We're so quick to run to their rescue. Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. Maybe you'll understand better when I get there. Whether it's through financial help of some sort or when we feel like we need to help them at the altar. I wonder if it's really more to help us because we don't like the way we're feeling. Whenever people are, are, are being touched by the Lord, Right? Sometimes people will come to the altar and the Lord's touching them. And the next thing you know, we're like, I got to, you know, I got I to intervene, right? And I'm not saying there's never a time to intervene. That's not what I'm saying, because I do believe that many times the Lord will lead us and guide us to minister and to be used as vessels. But what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes I think that in some cases, maybe we're the ones that are feeling uncomfortable. But I got to ask a question. Is there a better place for someone to be than in the hands of the Lord? Is there a better place for someone to be than to be broken in the hands of the Lord? Can we not trust people in the presence of the Lord? Can the clay not be trusted in the potter's hands? I've seen people crying in the presence of the Lord and then someone come up to them and say to them, they would say this, they would say, it's okay, he forgives you. And then I heard that person later say, but I wasn't. I wasn't done yet. You, you see, many times we don't really know where that person's been. Yes, yes. That's right. We don't know what they've done. And we don't know. If you've never been dealt with at the core of your heart for, 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 for the places that you've been and for the places that you've brought the Lord, there's a possibility that you've never experienced true repentance. Sometimes repentance takes place and there's emotion involved and there's crying involved and there's wailing involved. But sometimes there's not a lot of emotion. Sometimes it's just a broken heart. It's a beautiful thing, actually. Because, see, what I've learned is this, is that when my heart has been repentant towards the Lord and I respond, that oftentimes it just, it just brings me even closer to him. 
And the closer I get to him, the more desire I have even to repent even more. We don't know where they've been. We don't know what the Lord has been saying to them. Somebody said to me the other day, I've been repenting for two weeks over my sin. And he said, I've been repenting for two weeks over my sin. And the crazy thing is, I didn't even know or realize that I had been sinning against God like that. Come on. And you know, a lot of times our first inclination is to try to like, like console that. Like I can remember Sister Took when I first got saved. I can remember her saying, God bless her, because I kept going to the altar. Kept going to every service. I would go to the altar. And I I'm just like, I just felt the, the Lord all over me. And I just felt like I needed to go to the altar. She said, Brother, if the Holy Spirit's telling you to come to the altar, you just go on and come to this altar as much as you want to. But really, if you repented, you don't have to keep uh, you don't have to keep coming up here. I don't know what you feel when you get into the presence of the Lord, but sometimes I just want to kneel in his presence. That's right. yeah. Sometimes I want to lay face first. Sometimes I want to lift my hands. Sometimes I want to cry. Sometimes I want to run around the church. I want to tell him that I love him. I want to thank him for his faithfulness. I want to thank him for saving someone like me. And I want to thank him for not leaving me over there where I was. You loved me, Lord. You came and you got me, Lord. I owe you everything. Even after he was good to me, he, he loved me. And, and even after he was good and I wasn't good to him, he loved me. I still didn't treat him right. No, you leave me alone if I want to cry and sob in his presence. If I want to repent every week or every, every service, please let me repent. Please let me get my heart soft. I'd rather my heart be soft and broken before the Lord than it be callous and hardened in his presence. Conviction of the Holy Spirit reveals to a person in need to repent. And true repentance, listen to me, church, this is so good. True repentance leads to a broken and a contrite yes. heart. Yes. King James Version, let's go through a few scriptures here. Psalm 34 and 18. The Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart and saves such as be of a contrite spirit. You know, it's interesting to me that the guy in the world said he believed in the Old Testament, but not the New Testament. And some people in the church don't want you to read out of the Old Testament. Yeah. Amen. It's the same God. Yeah. And he said in the Old Testament that the Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart and saves those that are of a contrite spirit. And that's how he felt then. He still feels that way today. When your heart is broken and contrite. Let's, let's look at that. What does the word break broken mean? To break. <laughs> To destroy, to break in pieces, to crush, to hurt it. The heart to be pierced. Does God want to hurt your heart? If you're in rebellion against him, you better believe it. Because he wants to wake you up. He wants to wake me up. He wants to get a hold of us because he loves us. Yes. Contrite, to collapse physically or mentally. To break, to be crushed, to be contrite, to be broken. Can you imagine that? Isn't that, isn't that a beautiful thing to finally collapse in the presence of the Lord? And, then, and just to be broken yeah. in his presence, to finally come to a place of brokenness and just collapse, whether it's physically or mentally. Lord, I collapse in your presence. I give up. I quit. I give up on me trying yes. to do it in my own yes. strength yes. and I yield to you and I ask you to have your way. See, that's the problem with a lot of believers. They don't realize they, they don't realize what it means to rest in what Jesus has done. When Jesus died on the cross, I got to tell you something. He didn't die. And I know I say this a lot, but it's so important that you get a revelation. He didn't die just to set you free from your sins so you could go to heaven. When he died on the cross, he also broke the power of yeah. sin. Yeah. Listen to me. Let me say that again. When he died on the cross, he also broke the power of sin. And when you trust in him, grace flows. Grace is the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. That means if you had a problem with sex outside of marriage, guess what? You can be free now in the name of Jesus. If you had a problem with drinking too much, come on, keep worrying. Guess what? You can be free now in the name of Jesus. If you had a problem with drugs, if you had a problem with bad thoughts, if you had a problem with the wrong kind of mouth, if you had a problem with anger, if you had a problem with being mean, if you had a problem with being rude, if you had a problem with talking behind people's back and you couldn't shut, you couldn't stop it yourself. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. You got access to grace. Amen. And he can give you freedom and he can give you liberty. I just got to give you the good news tonight. You don't have to stay in slavery. 
slavery to the bondage of the enemy. The scripture says Jesus has set the captive free. Yes. Listen, we got to be learn how to believe the word of God. The enemy wants to make you believe your past. The enemy wants to make you believe your present. I'm here to tell you that the enemy is a liar. They used to like to say he only speaks one language, lionese. That's what he speaks. That's what Jesus told the religious folk. He said, no, your father's the devil. Your father is a liar and you're of your father, the devil. He's a liar. You're a liar. Don't believe a lie, church. The word of God says you're free. And do you, you believe, you shake your head, you, believe, you don't have to shake your head anymore. But you understand what I'm trying to say. I just want you to agree with me, my friend. Yes. I want you to agree with me. Now listen, if you don't start getting into the word of God, you're not going to make it. Right. You're not going to make it because you need, listen, I'm not talking about to just open up the Bible and to say, I got three down today, wait for them till tomorrow, I'll get four. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about letting the word of God have its way in your heart. Letting the word of God re-enculturate you. Man, listen, then we've been listening to Jay-Z and Snoop Dogg and Van Halen and Motley Crue and then this one and that one for God knows how long. We've been listening to what our friends were saying was cool and what wasn't cool. And we've been listening to what the girls thought was cool and wasn't cool. When are we going to start listening to what the Lord says holiness and righteousness and a second half is free. I don't like that kind of preaching. Well, we need to learn how to love that kind of preaching. Yeah. That the Lord, that we would let the Lord have his way and then reenculturate us. Yes. I talk about that all kind of stuff all the time. Some of y'all probably bored with the story. But listen, my, my mama was from Lake Arthur, is from Lake Arthur. And, and you know, she's heard the story. Her people, her, her, well, they drank scotch whiskey and they played dominoes till about three o'clock in the morning. And my daddy was from Baton Rouge and he liked to drink in bar rooms and, and liked to fight. And he fit in real good with their family. And I can remember being about 12, 13 years old, sitting in the living room in Lake Arthur, okay, as there are about 15 of them at the table playing dominoes and, and they all getting rowdy. And this is the, I was enculturated to this. Okay, there was some good stuff. Eat some gumbo bacon in the morning, okay? But what I'm trying to get at is I was being enculturated. And then the next thing, you know, what's your story? Plug your story in. And then I go to the eighth grade and girls get pretty. And then, you know, and you're trying to, like, talk to the girl. And you're, like, you're getting enculturated. And you start listening to various kinds of music because everybody's listening to it. And it's all so cool. And you start trying to hang around with the cool people. And you start getting into your own mess and your own life. And then you open up doorways to things and you're being enculturated to the ways of the world and now you get saved if you really got saved if you really repented come on yes. somebody help me come on. and if you don't listen to what the word of God says and you're like me and you get in trouble and then they tell you oh for you to get your nursing license you're going to have to go see the addictionologist and he says oh you rob houses son you're an addict and you'll always be an addict and I'm here to tell you that's not what the word of God for the God is our new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have So you can take that rehab jargon, mixture of psychology with theology and addictionology. I'm here to tell you if there's an addiction connected to it, it's because there's a demon spirit in the wickedness of your own lustful heart and your lustful heart want to have a party with a demon spirit. I'm here to tell you Jesus defeated demons when he died on the cross. And we also want to crucify your flesh, my flesh, but we, but we, we want to fast track. Mm. We want a faster way to get there. We want it to happen today. Right. We want it, it already happened. It happened 2,000 years oh, ago. Yeah. But the question is, will we believe that? And will, yeah. we, will we even read it to believe it? Oh, Lord, my Lord. And when we read it, will we believe it? Mm. Hallelujah. A broken and a contrite heart he will not despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Yes, yes. Isaiah says, for thus says the high and lofty one 
that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. He said, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You know what the problem that I learned in AA, I didn't mean to get off on that, but I'm there. And I'm talking about it as much as I want, just like I'll talk about Catholicism because I was born and raised a Catholic and I had to go to AA. And when I sat in them AA classes, and I, I, I told y'all this story before, but let me say it again. And listen, the first time I said Jesus, because look, he said it's a higher power. You need a higher power, right? Y'all heard that story before, right? He said, and I said, okay, well, Jesus is my higher power. Well, well, that's good, son. That, that's good. And then, and then guess what? I said Jesus the second time, or I said Jesus the third time. And next thing you know, they start getting kind of jittery. And they, they don't like the name of Jesus being spoken that much and they're like well I'm glad you found what you're looking for son but look if they want this table to be their higher power or if they want that squirrel like John said to be their higher power then then you know what just let them no 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 that's pride that's not a broken and a contrite heart. That is a refusal to lower self. There ain't no table or a squirrel going to be able to set nobody free. Really what's happening is, is that they're putting their faith in the human spirit is what they're doing. They're putting their faith in willpower. And they're lifting themselves up in pride. And I'm here to tell you that repentance and a contrite and a broken heart, God will not despise and he will move towards that. And, and to recognize that I am dependent on you, Lord. That I need you. That I need your help. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You know, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want you to take it the wrong way. But we judge success in churches based on the numbers and on signs and wonders. Let me say this clearly. We need you in our services, Holy Spirit. We earnestly desire, or as the Greek would say, we've burned with zeal for your spiritual gifts. We welcome the healer in this place. I meant to give you the microphone so you could sing that song, The Healer's in the Room. The healer's in the room that miracles break out across this place. Who is this king? Who is this king? His name is Jesus. He's the light of the world. There's freedom in his name. Hallelujah. But people will seek after signs and wonders, my friends. Yes, yes. Jesus warned us. People will seek after signs and wonders to the point they will fill up auditoriums in anticipation that they will get to see a miracle. Mm. But signs and wonders and increases in numbers do not always do not always equate to God's purposes for mankind. Matter of fact, the scripture says in 2 Peter, it says this, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would reach repentance. Yes. yes. The day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. This is what he says in verse 11 of that passage. He says this, since all these things are to be dissolved, talking about everything that you see, everything that you face, it's all going to be dissolved. So what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Yes, yes. Peter's saying, how are you going to live my life? Knowing that the things that we're facing today, all this stuff's going to be burned up. MMA is going to be burned up. The UFC is going to be burned up. Conor McGregor is going to be burned up. All these people are going to be burned All this stuff is going to get burned up. Lord, save their soul. Yes, yes, Lord, save them. Listen, I'm going to close with this. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. In Luke 16, it tells a story about the rich man and Lazarus. Y'all remember that story? It said that there was a rich man. That ended up in torment. And that there was a man named Lazarus. Not the one that Jesus resurrected from the dead. <coughs> but he, this, this, this poor man Lazarus was a beggar. And he lay by the rich man's gate. He had sores all over him. And the Bible says that the dogs would lick his sores. 
And they both died and they went into a place called Abraham's bosom, which is also the place that Jesus spoke of when he told that thief on the cross that today you will be with me in paradise. And the rich man saw Lazarus over there across the, in the, on the gulf. And he said, hey, hey, Father Abraham, get Lazarus to dip some water and put it in my mouth because I'm really, really thirsty. He said, no, you can't do that. He said, look, you had your opportunity on the other side. I'm paraphrasing. And, and, and you didn't take your opportunity. And besides that, we can't really get over there to where you are. There's a, there's a gulf that's fixed between us and it's separate. He says, well, won't, won't you send someone to tell my brothers? Go Send somebody to go tell my brothers. No, he said, send Lazarus to go tell my brothers. Because, see, they'll remember Lazarus because they remember him out there by the gate. Ain't no telling what him and his brothers were saying about Lazarus. But nevertheless, he said, send Lazarus to go tell my brothers. And and, and the Lord, the, the Abraham says, no, they, they got Moses and the prophets. They, they, could, they could read Moses and the prophets, and then they would be able to learn about God. He said, no, but if you send someone, see, I'm talking about signs and wonders right now. But if you send someone from the dead, they would believe. He said, no. Even if someone came back from the dead, they would believe. Isn't that something? Jesus rose from the dead. And he's living on the inside of people's hearts. Sometimes it makes it hard for people to believe that he's really alive because they're not seeing a reflection of him in our lives. Lord, help us. Yes. Amen. But whenever we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way and change us, it becomes a reflection of his goodness and his glory. But sometimes they still won't believe. And then there's the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee's over there, you know, it describes religion. It describes self-righteousness. And he's saying, I thank God that I'm not like these other people. You know, you got to be careful, Christian. You don't want to compare yourself to other people. You don't want to think that you're better than what you are when you compare yourself to other people. It's important that we understand that just because just because you, you feel like you're spiritually on cloud nine and you, you look around at other people and they don't look like they don't look like what you think Christians should look like, you need to be careful because see, that's not the plumb line. That's not how you measure true spirituality. You measure it based on Jesus. And the Pharisee said, I thank God that I'm not like other people, and especially this tax collector over here. I pay my tithes. I go to church. Basically, I go to the synagogue. And then that, then it said about that tax collector that he wouldn't even look up to heaven. And he just sat there and he beat his, he beat his breast. He beat his breast and he called himself, when he knew that he was, he called himself a sinner in the eyes of God. And he asked God to have mercy on him. And you know what Jesus said? Who do you think went home right that day? Who do you think went home justified that day? Jesus said it was the one that got his heart back. The one that recognized that he needed help. I want to encourage you tonight. Amen. Take with you this message. Praise God. We're going to sing a song. If you got to go, I understand. We always want to leave the altars open. If you need the altars, if you need prayer for anything. But I want to encourage you. Take this message with you and understand that God, God wants us to repent. Amen. God wants us to yield ourselves to him and let it have his way in our hearts. We give you glory and honor tonight. Holy Spirit, I pray. I pray for your people, Lord. I pray that you would minister to every heart. That you give hope. That you give strength, Lord God. We thank you for your goodness and your long suffering and your patience in our lives.